Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Introduction to JBL DSI 2.0 Dedicated Cinema Amplification System and JBL Sculpted Surrounds presented by Sunil Karanjikar. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenter and he'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control, and we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our learning session workshop series on pro.harman.com. We're adding new sessions daily and have over 30 sessions scheduled for this fall and winter, so watch for those on the calendar. And now I'd like to introduce you to Sunil, the presenter for today's webinar. Sunil has been with Harman for seven years and specializes in system design, including loudspeakers, amplifiers, DSP, and mixing. Prior experience includes 11 plus years of designing tour sound systems and mixing large scale concerts. He is currently the product manager for Cinema Solutions. And now I'll pass it over to you, Sunil. Thank you, Laura, for that introduction and putting together this uh, webinar series. Uh, greetings to all of you and thank you all for joining us today. We're gonna touch down on two topics today. One is the JBL DSI 2.0 series of dedicated cinema amplification, as well as JBL sculpted surround. Uh, as you all know, JBL has had a strong connection with cinema. Uh, in fact, some of the very first JBL systems were designed specially for cinema. And so we've decided to leverage that brand recall value for most people and badge our new amplification system as JBL. Now, why we do that is because uh, this particular amplification system is uh, something that was designed from ground up, especially for cinema. So we've got a bunch of uh, unique feature set that is uh, typical within uh, cinema uses, as well as uh, designing the amplifier power output to suit uh, the loudspeakers that we currently have in our lineup, as well as the ones we're looking at introducing in the near future. So looking at some of the uh, features on the amplifier, uh, we've got cinema centric uh, communication protocols. We've got uh, SNMP, both polling as well as uh, trap alert notifications. We've got a small uh, feature command set for uh, TCP commands that you can uh, send via the TMS LMS uh, systems. We've got uh, all cinema loudspeaker uh, speaker tunings within the amplifier. So you don't have to import or, or create your own anymore. We've got continuous load monitoring, again, something that is designed especially for uh, cinema applications. And then we have a special dash D version, which is the digital input uh, networked audio amplifiers that are compatible with Dolby's uh, Atmos Connect AES67 stream. The amplifiers are uh, six models within three power categories, and we simply uh, call them uh, SA for the small amplifier, MA for the medium, and LA for the large amplifier. And then they're available in two versions, uh, the standard version, which is the analog inputs only. And then we have a dash D version that gives you analog input as well as the AES67 network audio inputs that is compatible with uh, Dolby Atmos Connect. Now, all of these amplifiers are uh, optimized for a four ohm load power delivery, uh, as you can see up here, uh, as well as uh, the SA and MA are optimized for two ohm loads if you were to put multiple surround speakers on a single amplifier channel. Uh, I'd like to call your attention to uh, the slight difference between the MA and the LA. Uh, soon as you look at this chart, you'll notice that the LA does a lower power in two ohms uh, compared to four ohms, and this might seem as an error. Uh, well, the MA and the LA are essentially the same amplifier, but tweaked for different uh, applications. The MA is tweaked to give out more current uh, in into loads, and this is something that is uh, important for long-term sustained SPL as you would need from low frequency elements or subwoofers. The LA is tweaked to do a higher uh, voltage output into the load. 
and this is something that you need for uh, instantaneous uh, SPL that would be required for screen channels as well as uh, surrounds. So that's uh, the primary difference between the MA and the LA. Uh, if you're looking for amplifiers for subwoofers, the MA uh, is the amplifier we recommend for that application. Uh, physically, uh, all the three models, or all the six models within the three power variants uh, share the same uh, dimensions. So it's the same depth, the same uh, weight. Uh, they have the same uh, IO connectivity uh, on the back and they all have the same input sensitivity. Now, what that means is if you were to connect all uh, of the models uh, through the analog inputs, the inputs on the amplifiers would clip at the same time, uh, thus allowing you to have a much more linear operation of your entire system. This also lets you from a, a maintenance or a backup point of view to be able to swap an MA with an LA or an MA with an SA for the time being without having to worry about changes in gain. The only thing that you would compromise in this situation would be the headroom available from that particular amplifier. Let's look at the back panel on these amplifiers. Uh, we've got uh, the IEC mains, which is a universal power supply input, and all models share the same 16 ampere uh, power inlet. Uh, for the analog inputs, we've got two six pole Phoenix style uh, connectors for balanced uh, analog audio. For the speaker outputs, we've got uh, two four pole barrier strips that accept uh, uh, spade lugs or terminal forks, as you call it here. Uh, and those uh, lugs can accept up to a 10 AWG of loudspeaker cable, uh, so uh, big enough cable to be able to do subwoofers as well. We have uh, the Ethernet port that is standard on all models, and this port is used for control and communication. So you can use Audio Architect for uh, full in-depth control down to the granular level. Uh, you can use uh, TCP IP commands for a small set of uh, control that would be required for day-to-day -day operation, as well as uh, SNMP monitoring, both for polling as well as uh, trap alert notification. We also have the orange uh, connector, that's the GPIO port. And this is an uh, eight port Phoenix style connector that uh, allows for amplifier status, uh, remote sleep, muting of channels, uh, recalling a particular preset, uh, et cetera. And you can use this uh, in the cinema world with a junior kind of a box to interface uh, for uh, relay control as uh, well. The only difference that the Dash uh, D has compared to uh, the standard version is an additional two jacks for the AES67 networked audio. So we have two uh, ports that are labeled as primary and secondary, and this can be run in redundant configuration or as a switched configuration like we'll see in, in the next slides. On the front panel, uh, we've got uh, eight buttons, uh, four for uh, selecting particular channels, uh, four for muting them. From the menu perspective, we have a menu button, a back button, and a rotary encoder that also doubles as the enter key. And then we have a power button with uh, a multicolor LED that indicates uh, power supply status, uh, the amplifier ready state, AC faults, as well as uh, idle mode that we will discuss in uh, the future slides. We also have a color LCD screen uh, that gives you a lot of information for setting up the amplifier if you choose to do so without having to boot up a computer, as well as show you all diagnostic information as well as uh, setup information uh, that may be necessary for changing levels or, or loudspeaker tunings. Uh, there is a a wizard that's there as part of the front panel uh, setup that allows you for uh, allows you a quick uh, input output configuration, loudspeaker uh, preset setups, uh, changing uh, room EQ or basic input delay to the amplifiers. The screen uh, has is uh, auto configurable configurable configurable. Sorry for that. <laughs> uh, for uh, 
dimming down if it's not being used you can also choose to have it shut down completely uh, based on a timeout that you can either program in the front panel or via audio architect we've got multi uh, segmented uh, input meters which again can be chosen to uh, be kept on or have them blacked out after a particular time if you were installing this uh, within the auditorium itself the front panel is a uh, tamper proof which means if it does not detect uh, activity for 30 seconds uh, it locks down and then you need a particular key combination to unlock the front panel to access uh, any settings again there is also a hard uh, lock available from within audio architect that can only be defeated via uh, software again so uh, it's pretty tamper proof from the front where the amplifier really shines uh, with all the feature set it has is if you start using it with uh, audio architect and some of the processing features you have within the amplifier is uh, a full input output routing you can choose uh, any of the four analog inputs or any of the four networked inputs if you're using a dash d amplifier to feed any of the channels as well as <coughs> uh, choose a uh, speak across over eq uh, delay uh, limiting uh, features from within audio architect itself if you are using third party loudspeakers we also have a a pretty uh, defined limiter section and what this has is our limiter max suite that includes uh, peak limiting rms limiting as well as a special thermal limiting which ensures that you get maximum spl from your loudspeakers while keeping your transducers uh, safe uh, what's new in this amplifier uh, compared to some of the others we've had in the past uh, again is the new speaker tuning uh, wizard and what the speaker tuning wizard does is allows you to choose a speaker tuning for each amplifier output without having to be locked down in a preset situation so this allows you to uh, in this example let's say choose a a screen loud speaker on channel 1 2 and 3 as as a three way and then on the fourth channel you can choose to have a surround loud speaker or a, a surround subwoofer uh, if you will so you can make the most of uh, your amplification investment i'll go back here uh, we've also simplified the speaker uh, preset process in here is that the loudspeakers are categorized as screen arrays for all the screen channels as surrounds and as subwoofers for uh, lfe so it just makes uh, the job extremely easier for a uh, typical uh, loudspeakers such as the c200 series that allow both a passive and biamp operation you can choose uh, the mode or the usage as well to be uh, passive or two way or three way based on the loudspeaker that you were using uh, this just helps reduce the number of steps that you would take to to set up the loudspeaker tuning uh, in this case new also is uh, the continuous load monitoring that we developed for uh, these uh, amplifiers uh, we had this request for a very long time on people wanting to be able to uh, verify if all the surround loudspeakers were working or if the screen channels were connected uh, what we need to do uh, within this is when you set up the room you put in the nominal impedance of the loudspeaker and then you set the high limit or the and the low limit uh, window that uh, is allowed as part of uh, the deviation and one thing to note over here is that most loudspeakers uh vary their impedance based on on usage as well so uh, you should be careful to set the high limit and low limit uh, accordingly once that is done and there is adequate uh, input signal present on the amplifier the amplifier starts measuring the impedance of the loudspeaker and you will actually see that number uh, in the measured impedance uh, tab out here and then we have a load status box this changes between normal uh, and it's normal if the impedance is within the high and low limit set by the user it goes to high if the impedance crosses both the lower and the higher limit on the higher side and it goes to low if the impedance falls below both the higher and the lower limit now every time there is a load status change from normal to high or low or back from high and low to normal 
the amplifier sends out a SNMP trap notification to the host, uh, letting them know that there has been a, a change in load status on the amplifier. You also see this information within Audio Architect uh, if you allow it to log the uh, errors on the amplifier and you can choose to have an email sent to you if uh, any of those uh, alarms are logged into the system. <clears throat> there is uh, more information uh, within global settings within Audio Architect and this gives you uh, a lot of features to be able to configure uh, power saving modes. We've got two power saving modes on this amplifier. Uh, we have ACD, which is the auto channel disable. What this does is the user sets up uh, the ACD threshold or the threshold of signal level, as well as the time that it should, should pass if the signal is under that particular level. Uh, in this case, if the uh, signal to the amplifier would go below 60 dB for 10 minutes or more, then that particular channel will shut down. Uh, now this boots up pretty quick. Uh, it takes about a second for the amplifier channel to turn back on again. We've tested this with some surround content as well, but uh, we recommend that you uh, make sure that the use is uh, properly. What we developed, especially again for cinema, is the idle mode, which is our second power save mode. What idle mode does is it turns off the power supply that feeds the actual amplifier section within the system. Uh, if you look at the amplification system, there's uh, two parts to it. There is the networking and DSP part, and then there is the amplifier part. So the idle mode shuts down the power supply to the actual amplification part. Uh, you can trigger this either via Audio Architect, like you see over here, or uh, via TCP IP commands from your TMS using an end of day script to shut down just the amplification part for, for power saving. And you can do the opposite of that in the morning at the beginning of the show to send a wake up command again from your TMS or uh, LMS. You get a whole uh, a bunch of uh, monitoring information on the left hand side, which is everything from amplifier model number, serial uh, power supply status, channel temperatures, as well as uh, front panel security, uh, which is the lockout and the blackout that I spoke of earlier, as well as uh, the timeout that you can choose for the display or the meters. In this case, we have set it to always on but you have an option of uh, particular times that you can put in here after which the display and the meters will uh, shut off automatically. There's also some configuration for GPIO if you were to use this for uh, fire alert, safety mutes uh, and the like, or recalling a different preset if you were using the cinema for uh, an alternate content application before or after the shows. The most uh, exciting part about these amplifiers is uh, the AES67 uh, bit on the Dash D versions. And this is uh, out of the box compatible with uh, Dolby Atmos Connect. And we've tested this to work with the CP850, the CP950, and the IMS3000 or the IMS3 as it's now being uh, called. Uh, this is a typical diagram of what you'd use if you're using an Atmos system. Uh, multiple amplifiers connected uh, through uh, two network switches. In this case, I've shown a single network switch with two VLANs. Uh, the red is all the control data and the blue is all the uh, audio data. If you were to use uh, up to three amplifiers within uh, a small 5171 setup with something like a CP950, you can daisy chain the amplifiers uh, for the audio network as well without having to go through a switch. So that's uh, additional cost savings when you do smaller rooms. How this is set up, uh, for most people who've used uh, any of the Dolby Atmos devices, the screen looks familiar. Uh, to ensure that this works with the DSi2, uh, we need to make sure that the PTP domain number is set to zero and the PTP priorities uh, one and two are set to 128. Uh, the destination multicast address uh, IP has to be uh, unique for each uh, 
device if you are putting everything on the same network. Uh, I've seen most people do not do this within cinema, but uh, this is something to be uh, aware of. Uh, we normally leave this within 239.69, and then you can change the remaining two uh, octets of the subnet uh, if you wish to do so. The last thing that we need to ensure that's done right is set up the RTP destination uh, UDP ports. And this has to be set up in increments of two. Uh, in our example, it's 7516, 7518, 7520, and so on. Uh, there is a reason uh, this is done uh, is just because the Dolby stream is not advertised on the network and we had to just ensure that there are no uh, errors while trying to read it within the amplifiers. Within Audio Architect, you have the RTP matrix router, like you can see uh, on the bottom of the screen over here. And the only information you need to put in here is the multicast IP address that we uh, set up in the Dolby device uh, in the previous slide. And the first port number, in this case, 7516, like we did for uh, the first port. Uh, once you've done that, you can <clears throat> just drag your matrix down over here, you have the incoming streams and channels on the top, and you have the amplifier inputs on the left hand side. In this case, we have uh, stream one channel five going to the first channel on the LA4D. You can also set it up uh, to send one channel to multiple amplifier channels like you see for the MA4 uh, at the bottom here. The SNMP portion we've been talking about for a while, uh, this is just to show you the kind of information that can be uh, read via uh, SNMP polling or what information is available on the SNMP trap notifications. Uh, you have all basic information you need, which is the device name, uh, firmware, serial number, uh, power supply, temperature, voltage, uh, the individual channel temperatures, input output metering, uh, the network information, so IP address and high unit ID for uh, further troubleshooting via audio architect if you have any alerts. Uh, and then you have fault information. The fault information is uh, a multi-data line and what this does is if any of the monitored information crosses a threshold that we've set up as a manufacturer, that might uh, affect the operation of the amplifier. It will pop up in the fault information uh, tab up uh, on the screen. And this information is also available uh, via the SNMP trap alert notification. So if there is uh, any sort of alarm, you will see it as uh, a notification on the SNMP host as well. You have uh, AES 67 information to show you the status of the connected or disconnected ports as well as uh, the continuous load monitoring information. You have uh, information as to the actual measured impedance versus what the nominal impedance should be. And if there is a change in status, like I said earlier, you will see uh, that as part of your uh, trap notification alert on the host as well. From the TCP IP command uh, perspective of uh, being able to link it with TMS and LMS units, uh, we offer a very small set of what we thought would be useful. So you can mute, unmute amplifier channels. You can uh, locate the particular device. Now this would be helpful if the NOC has to communicate to a service technician who's on ground to ensure that they are looking at the correct amplifier. Uh, when you locate this via uh, TCP IP, the front panel starts flashing. So the service technician knows the correct device he's supposed to look at or, or pull out for service. You can reboot the device. Uh, like we know most issues resolve itself upon a reboot. And then you can turn on and off the idle mode on the amplifiers to save power at the end of day, uh, either via the NOC or through your TMS uh, LMS services. So in uh, summary, the DSi2 uh, was designed specially for uh, cinemas. We've got uh, a full featured front panel to allow for quick configuration for smaller rooms, even without having to boot up a computer. 
we've got all loudspeaker tunings uh, already within the amplifier and there's a much more simpler way of updating these tunings uh, in the future. The built-in DSP allows for a lot of room processing, including uh, delay alignment for surrounds and uh, screen channels, as well as LFE, and a eight band fully parametric uh, EQ uh, standard on all inputs on the amplifier. Uh, again, we've got, uh, like I said, continuous load monitoring and the dash D versions have AES 67 compliant with Dolby Atmos connect without having to use uh, any third party interface boxes in between. Uh, for more information, you can just uh, search the web for JBL DSI uh, 2.0 uh, or go to jblpro.com and, and look for the product at the address that I have uh, down uh, here. That uh, pretty much concludes what we had for DSI 2. Uh, if there are questions again, please put them in the in the Q&A section and I'll get to it once we're done with the sculpted surrounds. So the JBL sculpted surround system is something that was developed by JBL uh, based on research in a few rooms on the dispersion and distribution of sound energy from surround loudspeakers in modern cinemas that actually use uh, stadium style seating. But before we figure out how this works, let's look at a typical uh, seven one system. Um, and I should mention here that the sculpted surround system is only applicable to five one and seven one systems. <clears throat> so a standard uh, channel based surround system uh, in this case, a seven one is based on uh, two uh, criteria that we use for localization. Uh, they are the ITD or the interaural time difference between your left and right ear and the ILD or the interaural level difference again between your left and right ear. Uh, based on the differences, your brain uh, calculates the location of where that source should come from. Uh, <clears throat> For a 7-1 system, uh, we know we've got three channels uh, for the screen, uh, which is the LCR. We've got two surround channels behind the listener as the rear surrounds. And we've got one surround loudspeaker on either side of the listener, as well as a dedicated LFE subwoofer uh, that is usually placed behind the screen. Now to make sure that the uh, ITD criteria is satisfied or the interaural time difference uh, is taken care of, uh, you notice that the loudspeakers over here are shown in a circle. Uh, of course, we cannot install it in a circle because most rooms are rectangular. And so we have to rely on uh, delay on individual loudspeakers to create a virtual uh, circle, if you will, to ensure that ITD is taken care of. For the level uh, or the ILD criteria, uh, the loudspeakers have to be calibrated to have uh, a particular SPL level. Now we know that in commercial cinema, uh, that screens need to be at 85 dB uh, C and that the surrounds have to be at 82 dB uh, C scale. And the LFE is supposed to be 10 dB uh, louder than the screen channels in its band of operation as measured on an RTA. Uh, notice there is no number over here because that number changes. Uh, this is something that's done when viewing on an uh, RTA. There is, of course, also uh, the location of the loudspeaker. So the side surrounds have to either be uh, 90 degrees to the listener or 110, so slightly behind. And the rear surrounds are typically set in a mirror image to your left and right screen channels. So it's kind of easier to do when you're uh, in a home theater, but once you start getting into uh, larger rooms like we're used to doing, we have a couple of issues that we resolve by uh, using multiple loudspeakers. Uh, the first one being that your side surrounds cannot be single loudspeakers anymore, and we substitute them with surround arrays. And also that the rear surrounds now instead of two loudspeakers are an array of either four or six loudspeakers. 
And this is uh, primarily because we tend to use the same loudspeakers that we did for the side surround. Well, doing this uh, creates a few more issues than we actually anticipate. And let's look at uh, a simulation of uh, a room with the front uh, screen channels, uh, with the rear surrounds, and with one set of side surrounds. What you'll see on the leftmost uh, simulation plot is that we have a variation of level from front to back, which is something that's common and uh, expected. So you have uh, set up your 85 dB at the reference position. You have a particular chunk of the room that's within that reference level. And then the further you go into the room, the level starts dropping and the level either gets way too loud in the front or it will drop based on the uh, design of the room and the particular loudspeaker being used. But the, the takeaway here is there is variation front to back. The second graph uh, shows you what it is, uh, what the variation is for rear surround arrays. And you notice that it's extremely hot closer to the loudspeakers and uh, quite soft uh, further down into the room closer towards the screen. Uh, now this is expected, but there is between a plus three and a minus four, a seven dB drop front to back. Now we know we cannot meet the ideal sound pressure level in every uh, portion of the room. So we tend to stick with a 3 dB variance as a window that is acceptable. Anything beyond 3 dB uh, will change the perceived location of the sound for the audience based on whichever loudspeaker is louder or hotter in that particular region. For the side surround speakers, we see a similar trend. It's louder, closer to the speakers and soft further down. But there is another issue that we're looking at is that side surrounds tend to get louder towards the back of the room compared to the front. Now, this is something that uh, is something uh, that, again, not intuitive. You don't realize why this happens. Uh, we did some research to figure out why this would be the case. And, and I'll show you in, in the next few slides. If we were to overlay the screen channels with the rear surrounds and the sides uh, into a single simulation. Uh, and we basically did that and broke it down again to show you that you actually end up creating three different zones. You have the central zone, which is within the 3 dB variance, uh, which is the acceptable level. So these people here get uh, the perception of sound localization the way it was intended. At the back of the room, you have a zone where the surrounds are much more hotter. Obviously, the rear surrounds are much more loud. And then the side surrounds create this rearward bias as well. Uh, and obviously, the screen channels are low in comparison now. Uh, and in the front, you have the section where you have absolutely no rear uh, surround information and that the screen channels are, are hotter than they are at the reference position. So this kind of gives us three different movie experience zones, uh, which is something we do not want. Things get a little more complicated once we overlay the right side surround uh, onto the left. And as you notice now, you have uh, again a hotter section towards the back of the room on the right. But the variation of level between the left and right, so you have the right surround the right side overlay, which is 2 dB louder over here, and the left is 1 dB lower than reference. So there is a 3 dB variation over here already. So once you start getting into the next color zone, you're pretty much dominated by the right side surround only. And it's the same on the opposite side. Once you're in the other uh, color zone, you're dominated by your left side surround. So how do we solve this issue? Uh, to do that, let's first look at how a loudspeaker actually uh, behaves. Uh, this is a coverage diagram of a particular loudspeaker. And so when uh, on a particular specification sheet, you read that a loudspeaker is uh, 90 degrees wide uh, in the horizontal plane and 50 degrees wide in the vertical plane. What it actually means is that on the edge of the coverage pattern, the loudspeaker is 6 dB softer than on the axis. 
So if the axis were to be 99 dB SPL uh, at the edge of the coverage, which is 45 degrees to the right or 45 degrees to the left, you now get 6 dB less, which is a 93 dB SPL. Now that coupled with every time you put a loudspeaker in a room, you lose 6 dB for every doubling of distance, the further away you go from the screen, it would actually make sense for us to point the axis of the loudspeaker to the seats that are furthermost in the room. So now you have more uh, even level front to back. But when we install surround loudspeakers uh, flat against the wall, and we're going to call them zero degrees uh, from now on. So when you have side surrounds uh, installed at zero degrees, what actually happens is uh, when you start drawing the arc of coverage, you notice that the strongest acoustical energy is just behind the loudspeaker. So this is the loudspeaker and the strongest acoustical energy where it actually meets the seating section is slightly behind the loudspeaker. Now this is what creates that rearward bias or why uh, you see sides around arrays get much more louder towards the end of the room. There is a second issue with this is now because the hottest portion of that particular loudspeaker is slightly behind the speaker for a listener over here, this speaker is softer and the front speaker is louder. So they are going to cue the side surround content as coming from slightly in the front. Uh, now this is something we do not want. And we'll look at this in uh, another view, which is uh, the top view of the, loud, uh, of, the, of the auditorium. For a listener who's sitting at this uh, black dot, they perceive the sound to come from the front because the loudest section is uh, just slightly behind every loudspeaker that is installed in the room. Uh, I was a lot more curious to figure out why this would happen. And so I did a simulation with an ease. And what ease allows you to do is look at uh, the room from the perspective of the loudspeaker. So uh, in simple terms, uh, this is assuming that the camera lens is inside the loudspeaker that is covering the room. And as you notice, uh, this gives us a very skewed view of the room. You see a lot more of the back of the room and uh, very little of the, of the actual lateral zero degree that you're supposed to be seeing and very little of the front of the room. Now this is the reason why most of the loudspeaker energy from side surrounds is pushed towards the back of the room and why a listener somewhere behind that loudspeaker will perceive the sound to come from uh, the front. So we had a couple of challenges to, to overcome this. One is design a loudspeaker that puts out more energy for the further seats and less energy closer to itself as well as figure out a way uh, for the loudspeaker to see the room uh, in the perspective that we intend uh, for it to be covered. That leads us to the 9300 series of surround loudspeakers. We've got two models in here. It's the 9300 and the 9310. The only difference being uh, in the max SPL between the two loudspeakers. Uh, you notice of a few things within this particular loudspeaker. To begin with, uh, let's look at the horn. Uh, what we use in here is called dual dissimilar arraying. Uh, in this particular loudspeaker, we have a single HF driver that's feeding a horn that's split into two parts, a vertical narrower and a vertical wider bottom. What this does is uh, creates a high pressure on the top which allows for more SPL to be thrown to the further seats and create lower pressure on the bottom, which puts out lesser SPL to the seats closest to it. Uh, the horn is keystoned in the opposite direction, which means it's narrower at the bottom and wider on the top, again, to help with better dispersion of high frequency energy. The other thing you notice is that the back of the loudspeaker now has a zero degree, which is a flat angle and then a 15 degree on both sides. Now this is uh, important when we start installing the loudspeaker in the room and we'll see uh, how that matters in the next few slides. Uh, this is what dual dissimilar arraying does. If you notice is you put out more uh, energy towards the top 
and lesser energy towards the bottom of the loudspeaker towards the closer seats. Uh, so this is very non-intuitive to most loudspeakers as we know where uh, loudspeakers are louder the closer you are to them and softer the further away you get from uh, them. We figured out that if we aimed each surround loudspeaker 15 degrees towards the screen, then this is the perspective that the loudspeaker sees the room at. And now you notice that the loudspeaker actually looks at the room from a very flat perspective. It's not skewed anymore. And you're actually looking at uh, a straight view to the opposite uh, wall. So this helps us with uh, the rearward bias that we've been talking about in the previous slides. Uh, a quick comparison between the zero degree standard directivity on the left hand side, which is the uh, traditional way of installing surround speakers and uh, 15 degree tilt towards the screen with sculpted directivity. Uh, you notice how for people uh, with standard directivity, the perception is from the front. With sculpted, the perception is from the back and I'll show you a, a simulation of how uh, we calculated that as well. Uh, the left hand side uh, shows you the traditional surround layout, which is the zero degree and the right shows you the 15 degree. Now you notice that the rear speaker, uh, this is the red dot is the listener in, in each of these uh, dots uh, in each of these plots and it's the same uh, position. That the rear speaker over here is 3 dB softer compared to the front speaker at that same location. Now, because the rear is 3 dB softer and the front is 3 dB louder, the perception is from the front. With a 15 degree tilt using uh, the dual dissimilar beam tilting that we have, the rear speaker is 1 dB louder than the front loudspeaker. Now, what that does is from a perception, uh, you perceive the side surround to be either right on the side or slightly behind exactly as the way it was uh, intended. Now, other than that, there is a uh, benefit to coverage. Uh, if you see this particular ease plot with a zero degree uh, side surround layout, uh, every color in this plot actually shows you a different SPL level, uh, yellow being hot and uh, the pink magenta being uh, slightly lower in, in level. And you notice that this thing is quite spotty uh, compared to uh, 15 degree surround speakers within the same room, same location, just tilting the speakers 15 degrees towards the screen gives us a much more smoother coverage in the room uh, front to back. And you can see this uh, side by side in the isometric view as well. The left screen is, uh, the left plot is uh, zero degree surrounds, uh, a lot more spottier coverage. And the right hand side is the 15 degree tilted surrounds, which much with uh, much more uh, smoother coverage. So this uh, basically takes care of your side surrounds. We've, we've kind of solved the issue of uh, the side surrounds that we had. Still leaves us with one issue, uh, which is the rear surrounds. Uh, as we saw in the previous slide, we have a 5 dB variance, uh, 7 dB variance, sorry, from uh, the back of the room to the front, where it's extremely loud closer to the surrounds and uh, quite soft uh, the further down you go uh, away from the loudspeakers. Uh, we figured out we could solve this by developing a brand new loudspeaker, uh, the JBL 9350 that uses uh, three patent pending technologies within them. Uh, this was the first loudspeaker to use a dual dissimilar arraying. If you can notice on the bottom, we have two horns. Uh, the bottom is split again. Uh, and the two horns use two different compression drivers because this is a high power loudspeaker. Uh, to help tilt the high frequency beam downwards compared to a standard loudspeaker. Uh, this loudspeaker also allows a switchable directivity pattern, which means you can switch between a rear and a side uh, mode of operation. And we'll look at that in the next slide. The third part, uh, the third patent is the acoustic aperture waveguide. And this is a floating lens on the woofer that we use to collect the mid frequencies from the woofer 
and allow it to sum better with the high frequencies also to give us a much better horizontal uh, pattern control on this particular loudspeaker. When you switch between the rear mode and the side mode, uh, this is what it does to the output. Uh, in rear mode, it beams the output uh, 20 degrees downwards and sends maximum energy towards the furthermost seats, which is towards the screen in this case, and less energy, which is over here that is closer to the people who are sitting uh, behind and closer to the loudspeaker. When you switch the speaker to side mode, uh, it does uh, exactly the same thing that the 9300s do, which is uh, do uh, asymmetrical coverage pattern, but send more uh, SPL towards the axis, which is further down into the room and uh, less energy to the seats that are closer to the loudspeaker. When you look at the simulation on these two loudspeakers, uh, what we figured out is for most rooms up to 60 feet wide, you can just use 29350s for rear surrounds because they're much bigger, louder loudspeakers with sculpted uh, waveforms to take care of uh, the dispersion within the room. And you'll immediately notice that now instead of having a 7 dB variance, we just have a 3 dB variance from the front to back. Uh, 1 dB loud over here, uh, minus 1 on the other end, so that's a 2 dB difference. And then a third if you get out into uh, this particular zone. Uh, and you notice that even in the front, uh, you have a much bigger area now that is still within the 3 dB variance front to back. For rooms that are beyond uh, 60 feet uh, wide, uh, you can use up to four of the 9350s, again, to give you a 3 dB variance from uh, the front to back, uh, like you see in this particular graph. So now if we overlay the advantages we have with uh, dual dissimilar arraying, sculpted surrounds, and the 15 degree tilt for the side surrounds, as well as the rear loudspeakers into one common graph. Uh, what we see is we now have a much uh, bigger area that conforms to the reference uh, channel balance of 85 dB for the screen and 82 for the surrounds. And then we have almost 90% of the room within the minus 3 dB variance, uh, if you will. Uh, this now basically takes what was effectively 40% of the room in good uh, channel balance to now almost uh, about 80% of the room within that same zone. That's all I have for you guys uh, at this point in time, and I'm open to taking questions now. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you so much, Sunil. We do have some questions here. Um, the first one is asking, uh, CP950 in 7.1 mode, is there AES67 out from CP950 current version to be used with D version AMP? Yes, so the current version uh, CP950 uh, allows for up to 16 channels of uh, Dolby Atmos Connect AES67. We already have a few installs that use it with this configuration in um, some of our beta sites. Uh, but yes, to answer it, there are 16 channels of AES67 available. Uh, the same thing like the CP850, you need to get into the configuration page and change it from Blue Link to AES67. Okay, next question is asking, how much of a power savings is there when the amp is in idle mode compared to powered up? Uh, from our calculation, up to 70% of uh, power is saved when you turn the amp into idle mode because uh, the amps don't have to be ready for signal to pass through anymore. So 70% uh, of power saving. Okay, next question. Um, is it okay to use 93 series in the Atmos application when we do aiming towards CLA? Uh, yes, it is. But the only thing that you need uh, to uh, remember in this case is that the loudspeakers already beam sound down by 15 degrees. And that's something you want to take into consideration when you aim the loudspeakers. 
so you don't aim them like you would conventional surrounds but maybe slightly higher okay we have another question i'm asking if you can retrieve the clone files uh i'm not sure i understand that correctly but uh I'm assuming what you mean is if you have uh, amplifiers that you already set up within a cinema. Uh, now, if you use Audio Architect, you can save that particular file. And when you replace that amplifier in case the amplifier had a particular issue, as long as you use the same high unit ID, it will automatically retrieve the file from Audio Architect when you send it back on the network. Okay. Are there any changes or adapters you can suggest for use with the CPI 2000 where a client does not want to use a Dolby processor? Uh, for the CPI 2000, uh, there are uh, adapters to change from the HD 15 connectors to Phoenix connectors. Uh, there's a company called Odyssey that, that makes them and you can just tell them that you want uh, the connector kit for the CPI 2000 we already have a package that they sell for the CPI 2000. Okay, there's a question asking if there's a power load calculator for this amplifier. Uh, I do not understand that question. It's not as clear. When you say power load, do you mean uh, power supply from the wall outlets or power load calculator in the sense of how much power a particular loudspeaker needs? Um, there's no clarification. So Anish, yeah. if you want to write in, um, you know, we can move on and ask that again. Another question, is it possible to connect both analog and digital audio input in DSi 2.0 for redundancy if one of them has failed? Uh, you can, but the amplifier will not auto switch. You will need to send a command from uh, the NOC or via audio architect to switch between digital and analog. There's no automatic fallback. Okay, uh, another... oh. okay I think Anish has, yeah, Anish has the reply in there. So from the power outlet, uh, because we've capped the same IEC input to 16 amperes, as long as you follow uh, 16 ampere uh, breaker criteria, which is every 16 ampere outlet should have at least a 20 ampere uh, breaker on it, uh, the amplifiers will perform without an issue. Okay, we have another question asking, what is the ideal vertical angle at listener ear level WRT surround speaker position? Sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, sure. Um, what is the ideal vertical angle at listener ear level WRT surround speaker position? Uh, okay, so the angle, if you were to calculate from the listener position, and I would assume this is in the reference area, uh, would be uh, it should never cross 30 degrees vertically. So the high frequency horn on your surround speakers should be uh, within 30 degrees of the listener's ear. Zero being parallel to the ground, of course. Okay, next question. Can we import FI FIR filters in the DSI amplifiers? Yes, so the DSI amplifiers uh, support uh, 1024 taps at 96K and you can uh, import this uh, within each channel on the amplifier. The user manual for the amplifier has all the instructions on how to get that done. Okay, there's another question. Um, can 15 degree surround apply for normal speakers like JBL 8320? Uh, so yes, it will apply, uh, but you get part of the benefits. So like you saw uh, in the simulation I showed you with an ease, uh, aiming any loudspeaker 15 degrees towards the screen begins to see the room in a more flatter orientation like you desire. The only advantage you do not get uh, with uh, standard surround speakers is that you do not get a uh, dual dissimilar arraying that pushes uh, more sound SPL towards the further seats compared to the closer seats. 
Okay, and then we have a final question asking if a similar webinar could be offered on the new JBL C200 series of speakers. We could do it. <laughs> Happy to have you again, Sunil. <laughs> well, we could do it again. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Uh, we have another question that came in. Are the network inputs on the DSI 2.0 amplifiers Dante compatible? Uh, yes, they are. Okay. Um, another comment. It was a great session. I appreciate if you educate te technicians in use of correct gauge mains cords so the po power supply never starve of current. Uh, well, the good thing with most of our amplifiers is we ship it with uh, the appropriate power cord for each uh, country. But uh, this is a typical uh, math. You can just look up 16 ampere uh, cable gauge and, and you will get some information. Uh, unfortunately, where I come from uh, is we speak in mm square and not in gauge. So it's, it's difficult for me to put a gauge number. But I would say something like a 14 or a 12 gauge cable would uh, do the job. All right, wonderful. It looks like that was the last question to come in. So Sunil, thank you so much. Definitely appreciate you doing a, a session on this topic. I think this was a first for us in the learning series. Mm -hmm. and Thank you everyone for attending. We appreciate you giving your time to us today. Um, if you're interested in any upcoming sessions, you can find them out on pro.harman.com. There's a full calendar of our upcoming webinars. So thanks again, Sunil, and everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you guys. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Take care.